Okay, so we're continuing Kohelet. We're holding towards the end, the end of chapter Yud Aleph, chapter 11. And then we have one more predict to go in Kohelet. There's some very interesting ideas that he discusses here towards the end of the Perek. Some of them may sound familiar to you. Some of it is a continuation from last time. He's speaking about politicians, about uh, various uh, forms of uh, leadership. People who are in leadership positions can easily become corrupted uh, because of an interest that they have. And unfortunately, people have sometimes a hard time understanding, you know, how come they trusted someone, how come they believed in someone, and uh, they're disappointed. Kohelet, as he's done all the time in Mishlei and in, in, and in Kohelet Shlomo Melech, tells us the facts of life, the reality. As the famous pasuk, En Chadash Tachat Hashemesh. There's nothing new under the sun. The same problems that exist in the past exist today. The names have changed, that's all. People have certain weaknesses and you can't get around that. And therefore you have to take precautions. Rabbis tell us, Kabdeu Vechashdeu. Be respectful of every human being, but be suspicious too. You never know. You know, today somebody may be healthy, tomorrow he's gone. You know, nothing is, is guaranteed except for death and taxes, they say. <laughs> right? These are the only two things that are guaranteed. <laughs> so, it is very important that we gain a little bit of insight into the facts of life, so we shouldn't be disappointed. Uh, so we should have a better understanding of, of why thing, certain things happen and to be able to deal with them properly. How do you react to somebody who insulted you? How do you react to somebody who took your money? What do you do about uh, uh, obnoxious people around you? <laughs> yeah, we have these people and these kinds of issues all the time in every community. Uh, rich and poor, why don't the rich give as much as they should give? So he, he explains that. He gets into the guts, as we say in English, of all these uh, important topics. So we should have a better understanding of, of how human beings operate. Uh, in some ways, Hashem is very simple to figure out, in some ways. Because Hashem is all good, is straight, is honest. A word is a word. In other words, Hashem's world is a different world, in a sense. Hashem is Hashem. But human beings are human beings. Uh, the, the problems that exist between husband and wife, or between brothers, uh, or between neighbors or partners, these are problems that have existed all, of, all from, from the beginning. And it's important that we understand our limitations, in other words, what we can do about them, and what we cannot do about certain situations that are out of our control. And one of those situations is politics. Politics meaning those that are, that are, are in positions of leadership, that in, in itself is minashamayim, you should know. Whoever makes it to the top, whoever is appointed, that's not just because people voted for him. <laughs> it appears like that. A lot of things appear to us bederechateva, naturally, but it's all decided minashamayim. Akol bideshamayim, just about everything is in the hands of heaven, except for yirat shamayim, how we conduct ourselves, what we do with ourselves, as human beings, in other words, when it comes to mitzvot, performance of, of, of the mitzvot, whether it, be, it means to be kind or fair or not, this is up to us. So he goes on to explain that lishok osim lechem v'yayin yesamach chayim v'akesef yanet hakol. says, if you want to have a good time, you want to have a party, you want to make a big meal. He says the nature is that people love to eat. The nature of people is that they love to have a good time. And if you want to have a good time, lishok, then you make, a, you make lechem. You know, lechem over here means you make sauda. Lishok osim lechem. That's a fact. If you make lechem, you make a sauda, you make a big party, and you serve the most tasty Persian food, you're going to have a lot of people coming. <laughs> right? People like food. Just tell them there's food, they're coming. Even though they may not be interested in the program, they'll come for the food. This chok osim lechem. 
the yain, yisam ha'chayim, and you bring alcoholic beverages, wine, whiskey, that makes ha'chayim, that makes people very lively, makes people happy, right? And in the same way, he says, now he's coming to the punchline, in the same way that food and drink attract people and achieve a certain goal, you want to know what's the most powerful thing that will attract people? The one that will bring them running to you? Hakesef Ya'ane Takol. Imagine if I wrote on a flyer, for everybody who comes to the shiur, he gets a hundred dollars. Everybody would be here. It's not a lot of money. It's not a thousand. It's a hundred. <clears throat> I don't think there'd be room in this, in this uh, for a sitting room, right? There would, <laughs> if you come, a hundred dollars. What can go around? Somebody comes and sits for an hour, he gets a hundred dollars, <laughs> right? If you promise money, they come. They, they will come. That's the simple meaning. Kesef, he says, Kesef is very powerful. More than the drink and more than the food. Everybody comes. Some people don't care about food. Some people don't care about it. The commentaries tell us is that money has the ability to resolve many, many problems. Kesef takes care of everything. Unfortunately, right? Why unfortunately? Because sometimes money is used in the wrong ways. You know, people who have money, they have clout, right? So money can also be used in the wrong way. The point he's also trying to make is that don't think that although these things have results, food, drink, and money, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are the ones that you should strive for, that they're the ones that are going to make you happy. No, not necessarily. A lot of people have lots of money, and they're not happy. But he tells us the facts anyway. People think it will make them happy. People will go after it. People will try their best to become rich. Have you seen in a bookstore, many, many books titled, How I Became a Millionaire and How You Can Become a Millionaire Overnight? You know how you can become a millionaire overnight? You buy his buy book. <laughs> right? That's how he became a millionaire, because he sold people his book. Yeah? yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Right? Kesef, money, <coughs> success is mazal. It's pure mazal. Obviously, there's some good advice people can give others from their experience. Uh, good advice is always welcome, but it's not a guarantee. Nevertheless, people are attracted, you know, they want to make money. Hakesef yane takol is another very important idea. And that is what they say in Yiddish as meshmirt geites. I don't think most of you understood what I just said. In Yiddish there's a saying, uh, when you shmir, when you shmir means when you, when you grease. When you grease something, it becomes smooth. You want to get somewhere, you, you shmir. In other words, you give money. That's, so in Yiddish, they used to say that sometimes that's what you need to do to get by to, to, to cancel a decree against the Jews. They used to have to pay a bribe. They used to shmir. That's, that's the Yiddish word. They used to grease the hands of the authorities. And that is how they were able to accomplish whatever they needed to accomplish. With money, you can do it. That's what happens in some Latin American countries, unfortunately, that with money they're able to corrupt the higher authorities and get drugs in and commit all kinds of crimes. Don't worry, you get 25%. You know what 25% of, of $10 million is? I mean, depending on the money, depending on the, on the size of the bribe, I mean, almost anybody's corruptible, almost. The Torah says so. It depends on the amount of money. You tell a judge who has a long beard, who's a tzaddik, listen, with this case, I'm telling you, this is the way you have to rule, and if you do, you get a bonus. How much? One million dollars in your bank account. A million dollars? He's my, the Yetzer Ara is going to tell him, not the Yetzer the Yetzer Ara is going to tell me, no, with a million dollars you can retire. You can learn a whole day. You don't have to work. You can do many mitzvot. You can give tzedakah. That is how, the, how it works. Money is the most powerful Yetzer of all. Gemara says so. Money, of all the yetzarim, of all the evil inclinations, of all the temptations, money is the most powerful one. Even the, even the, the, the best, 
can fall for it. And that's why you have to be very, very careful. <laughs> I told you, I gave you examples of somebody finding a hundred dollar bill on the street on Shabbat. What will he do? We'll talk about somebody who's observant. He doesn't pick up money on Shabbat. But he sees a hundred dollars. It's tempting. Stand on it. So somebody tells me, well, I'll stay there till Motzei Shabbat. <laughs> you can do that if it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Shabbat. But what if it's Friday night? You're going to stay there till then. Come on. So somebody, another smart artist, told me, oh, I'll push it into the bushes. Yeah. What's the correct attitude here? It was meant for if it's meant for you, you, Hashem wants you to have it, He'll give it to you in a kosher way. Not in, yeah. Otherwise, why are you seeing it now? It's to tempt you. It's a test. Don't you realize it's a test? People don't think about it that way. They don't. They first see it, it's tempting. Had they remembered that there are tests in life, maybe they would think differently. But people are not focused on, oh, I'm being tested right now. But you are. You see? Yeah. Now, if it's during the week, of course, there's nothing wrong with picking up the money. But if, the, if, it's, if it's something which is asur, a person can easily become blinded if it's money. Money is very, very powerful, etc. And that's why he tells us over here that it's chaval me'od. That, getting back to what we were saying about politicians, it's chaval me'od, it's a shame that politicians and those that we spoke about before, last time, what, what, they do all these things for their own interests, and how are they going to pay for it? A kiss, if you're the called. The government. The government has money, and they take the plane. Imagine a politician takes a plane. You know how expensive it is to fly from, from I don't know, from Israel to Europe, for example. A whole plane for yourself. You know how many thousands of gallons of fuel? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, these flights, for one person or two people or three people. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I mean, the President of the United States, I guess, you know, he needs his own plane. And, but you have to be very careful with the money of the citizens, of the money of the Medina, of the country. There's so, many, there's so many other better uses to do with this money. Can we justify it? Yeah. But they're going to do lechem, yain, v'akesef, yanet akob. Don't worry. The, the country will pay for it. So this is unfortunately a problem that's always been around. People who are in the top position, they will say it's coming to them, and they do all kinds of things that are wrong, whether it's a kickback. Does everybody here know what a kickback is? You know, I do this for you, you do this for me. All kinds of things that are, are not right. And that's because it involves money. Unfortunately, when it comes to money, people bow down to it. It becomes like an avodah zara. It, it's, it's also, it opens up all kinds of doors. And you may and you might say, well, why? It's not fair. Don't complain. That's a fact. <laughs> That's it. Money has that kind of a power. All right. Next. The second half of this pasuk is very popular, very known. Not the first part. But it's all one idea. He says, even on your own, in your own, on your own, in your own thoughts, don't curse the king. When you're in your own room, bedroom, don't curse the rich man. What does the king have to do with the rich man? The two, are, what they have in common is that they have control over other people. The rich man may have uh, money that is owed to him. Uh, he does things for people. The king also has much good. And you may be very upset at them. Don't even curse them in your thoughts. What is he saying? Shlomo Melech is telling us, be very, very careful not to say something, even if you're by yourself, because the saying is, the walls have ears. Have you heard that? Yeah. And he says, Ki of the birds in the sky will transmit your words. Have you heard of the saying in English, a little birdie told me? I think this is where it comes from. In other words, words that are spoken somehow, if you don't want them to be heard, you better not, you're better off not even saying it, even if you're by yourself. In other words, that's how careful you need to be. Don't trust anyone. 
And unfortunately, sometimes when you tell somebody, don't tell anybody, that's, that's when he is going to tell. Because you told him not to tell, he forgets. He forgets usually, and he tells it anyway. That's how rumors spread, and that's how words you know, go out, and uh, eventually they come back to haunt you, these words. You didn't intend it to be known. So, Ofa Shamayim Yulichet Akol. Anytime it's words that should not be heard, be very, very careful. A thousand times careful. Ubala Knafaim Yegidavar. What's Bal Knafaim? Bal Knafaim is the owner of wings. That's also a bird. But here there's a deeper meaning. It's talking about things that are prohibited, according to the Torah, like Rashonara, like uh, gossiping, talking negative, making negative remarks about others. We're talking about the neshama eventually having to account for everything that it said in this world during its lifetime. And who's going to record all of this? A Baal Knafaim, there's a special angel. Baal Knafaim of wings. There's an angel that records that gets all these words, all these comments that were made, and eventually, Yagid Davar, he will be the one to testify on words that we may have even forgotten that we ever said. Nevertheless, they're very, very sensitive. Words can be very hurting, very painful. And things that are wrong are not forgotten. In other words, even though we did not record them, they did not disappear. They're somehow recorded in the Shamayim. So this particular point over here may not necessarily have anything to do with what we just said before, but it's a very important idea too. Be very careful with what you say. Don't think it, it will never be discovered. Once the word is spoken, there is a chance. There's always a chance that somebody was behind the wall, somebody was outside, somebody that you trusted will renege. In other words, he will not keep his word. All kinds of ways. If it's somebody that you really, really don't want anybody to know about it, then don't say it because eventually you may be caught, you know, because of those words. Okay, that's the end of Perek Yud. Perek Yud Aleph chapter 11 begins with another very famous pasuk. Shalach lach mechal Send your bread over the waters. Have you heard of the stories where people have found a bottle with a letter in it? Yeah. After many, many years even. I don't know, about all of them. Pick up a bottle at the beach, somebody sent it from across the ocean. And the waters eventually send, and eventually it arrives somehow. Here, the idea is, send your bread. Your bread means your charity. It means your kindness or your favor that you do to somebody else. Send it, send it off on the water. What does that mean? Even though the, one, the individual that you're giving to is going far away from you, you may never see him. You may never, therefore, anticipate that he will repay you back the favor. Do it anyway. Why? One of these days, many, many years later, perhaps, you will receive a return favor from that individual who you thought you'd never see again. Favors that are done for others are reciprocated. That's what he says. Now, it doesn't mean reciprocated by that exact same person. But send off, invest in tzedakah in helping, in being kind, because your kindness will pay off. And if it doesn't pay off somehow in this world for some reason, it will pay off in Olam Abba. So send it off. Don't worry about it. Send it off meaning don't worry about it. Just do it. You will see that from being kind to others, you never lose. From being charitable, you never <coughs> become poor. On the contrary, you will see a tremendous return on your investment later on. Yes. Is, is it considered if you're doing something with an expectation of return? So, for example, yeah. uh, you know, whether you're giving money to the Bet Knesset in front of everybody <coughs> you know, because of your ego, yeah. or it pumps you up a little bit, you get recognition, or you're putting your name It's okay, that's, ca that's, <laughs> that's called Shalola Shem Shemayim, when, when you give charity first because you want your name uh, to be known, you want it to, to be publicized. It's not pure, but it's fine. It's acceptable. It's, it's, it's a lower level. There are, le there are various levels of tzedakah. One of, uh, one of the higher levels is when you do it anonymously. You don't want to do all charity only anonymously because people will think you're stingy. You never give. So, what? so you want to no, know. You don't want people to have the wrong impression of you. That's not good. You want them to think normal of you or positive, but not bad. There have been stories of people who, were, who had this reputation that they were very, very stingy. 
And it was not true. They helped quietly, but it was wrong of them to do that. Some tzedakah you want to do quietly, but some tzedakah you want to do like in an appeal. Everybody gives something, contributes. You want to contribute too? Oh no, I'll contribute anonymously. No, no, no. This is a time to, to be seen because people see you give, they may give too because of that. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to do it in public sometimes. But if the person is in front of you, the poor man, you may want to do it in an indirect way so as not to embarrass him. That's a really different idea. So anyway, when it comes to sending off your bread, it means don't worry. It means have hope. It means that for every action there's a reaction. Here we're talking about a positive action. That eventually something good will come out of it. And the same is true with tochacha, giving rebuke, whether it's to a child or a relative or a friend. He doesn't listen to you. He's stubborn. He doesn't care. He ignores you. Does that mean you should give up? No. Send off your bread. Do whatever you need to do. One of these days, you could be 10 years later down the road, what you told him 10 years ago will make a difference in his life. All of a sudden, or little by little, drop by drop, the words will penetrate and will make a difference. Either they've made a difference quietly over the time, or all of a sudden they will sink in, as they say in English. All of a sudden, oh, you know, a, a parent may have said something to the child when they were 10 years old. And the child will remember that, hopefully something good forever. Hopefully that will bring them back. That will give them strength and encouragement. You never know. So it may appear that nothing is happening. You're throwing a bread on water. You're throwing it far away. It's never going to come back. A favor that is done, a word that is said, a kind word, may eventually, of course, come back in a positive way, that is. And therefore, don't give up hope in thinking not, nothing will come out of it. Rabbis tell us of a story with Rabbi Eliezer ben Shamua, who was once walking by the beach. And there were similar stories like this that the rabbis talk about. This one involved an individual who he saw at the beach that he was drowning almost, almost drowning. The ship had capsized, he saw this individual almost drowning, and luckily he was able to hang on to a log. And as he got closer to the beach, Rabbi Eliezer brought him in, helped him, and he saw that he was naked. So he gave him some clothing, he gave him some money, he took him into his home, he took care of him, showed him the way, really, really treated him very nicely. But, but Rabbi Eliezer was the only one who did that. Everybody else who this guy tried to approach as it was coming to the beach, all the other Jews that were there with Rabbi Eliezer said, ah, don't help, them. don't help this guy, he's an Edomi. Edomi is, he's from Aesav. And the way he thought of it, the Edomi said, well, Esav, yes, but I'm your brother. Esav is a brother of Yaakov. So from all the ones who were there who saw him, nobody wanted to help him except for Abeliezer. This man eventually became the governor of that region, of that area. And he made a terrible decree against the Jews. And they came to Abeliezer and said, only you can handle this situation. You know, you're our leader. He says, yes. I may be able to, but I need a lot of money because, you know, Edom loves money. You know, I need to bribe them. So they gave him 4,000 golden coins to go bribe. Anyway, when the governor saw Rabbi Yeza, he was excited to see him. He says, you know me? You remember me? He says, no. He says, I'm the one that you helped. You know, when I came over to the beach, nobody else helped me. That's why I'm upset at the Jews. That is why I decreed against them. And how can I help you? He says, well, I came to ask you a favor to, for a little bit of compassion, even though you're right, they didn't help you. But nevertheless, you know, please do me a favor. He says, well, you know, favors cost money by us. That's a policy. Mm -hmm. He says, I, you know, I brought you whatever you want, you know. But please cancel the decree. He says, I'll do it for you, only because of you, because you definitely uh, did the right thing and helped a person in his time of need. So, Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Ezra was able to cancel the decree. But, that's not the end of the story. The governor says, the money that you just gave me, it's for you. <laughs> I don't need it. He says, and the clothing that you gave me, now you have a choice. You can take as much clothing as you want from my wardrobe to give you. In other words, he rewarded him tremendously for his kindness years ago. That's the idea. Send off your bread. 
You don't even know. You have no idea what a little favor. You said a hello to somebody in the street. Somebody who is a, uh, I don't know, somebody from the street. He's a, you know, a homeless person. You never know. That homeless person may be mayor of Los Angeles one day. You know, everything is possible here. <laughs> you don't know. So be kind to everyone. Send your bread off. Even if you don't know, you don't think that anything will come out of it, something may eventually come out of it. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah. It may come, if you do good things, maybe somebody else is return the favor. Like if I yeah, yeah, because for every good act, there's a, without Hashem, another good act that will be reciprocated to you. It doesn't have to be from exactly that person. Yeah, I'm going to give you an Well, I, I can, there's a lot of stories that prove this point, that somebody was kind. They were kind to him with Shammai because of that. That's all it means. But sometimes it's from the same person himself. I like to tell a story that occurred about 20 years ago, maybe, maybe 25 years ago, on the New Jersey Turnpike, New Jersey Freeway. It was late at night after midnight. It was a cold winter night. And there was a limousine that was stuck. And all of a sudden, a Jew drove by and he saw the limousine that was stuck. No help in those days. It was hard to get any help, especially <coughs> with the blizzard conditions or, or difficult weather conditions outside. But the Jew stopped his car. And he came out to see how he could help. Uh, so the guy says, that the limousine driver says, well, the first thing I, I, I'd, I'd like to ask you is if you could call, let my boss know where I am, you know, and that he shouldn't get worried. He says, yeah, I'll take care of that for you. And in the meantime, let me see what I can do for you. I don't know if it was a tire, flat tire, or if it was something else. He really went out of his way to help this man at so late hour and where nobody else was stopping. So he called up the boss, and the boss says, okay, that's so nice of you that you stopped and you helped this uh, driver. You know, I very much would like to give you a gift for this. You know, what can I do for you? He says, no, thank you. No, we just, we, we, we don't take gifts. He says, but nevertheless, maybe I can send flowers to your wife? He says, oh, yeah, flowers to my wife. Go ahead and send flowers to my wife. So what's your address? He gave him the address. Anyway, so flowers were delivered to the house. Very nice. The man got a piece of mail several days later. Your mortgage has been paid off. Yeah. Your mortgage of the house is paid off. You know, usually it takes 30 years to finish your mortgage. <laughs> your mortgage has been paid off. Who was this man that paid off his mortgage? Donald Trump. The, the person who owned that limousine. See? Just a little thing. They stopped. Is true? true story, sure, yeah. <laughs> true story, yeah. Very, it's known. People forgot about it because it happened years ago. But it's a known story. You know, all he did was you know, a little favor. But he went out of his way. Nobody else stopped. Nobody else cared. And apparently, he was appreciative of that. He realized how dedicated this individual must have been to go out of his way to help someone so late at night in the conditions of the, of the weather. So that's how he rewarded him. That's very nice, no? <laughs> right. Anyway, let's go on to the next pasuk. But this is what you see. It's a very important point. Shlach lach mecha, in other words, you will see all favors that you do for others will be, one day will be repaid. Next pasuk. Ten helek leshiv'a v'gam nishmona kilot edam ayir al haaretz. A little bit difficult to understand what he's talking about. Without the commentaries, it would be hard. Give to seven, give to eight, because you don't know what terrible decrees may come unto the land. In other words, and you want to be spared from those decrees. So give seven or give eight. What is he talking about? So one pirush means even if you've given seven people tzedakah, don't stop. Continue to give to eight. Those, there are a lot of people who have an attitude, I've already given, that's it. Yeah, but somebody else needs your help, and you can help him. So give to seven, give to eight, continue to give. Because you don't know what will happen, Hazrat Shalom, what terrible decrees, or, or what the circumstances that you will be in, that you will need the merit, and you don't know which merit will help you. Which of all the merits that you did will help you. 
So that is why don't be so hard when it comes to helping people, even though you've already helped, continue to help. It could be that one of the ma'asim that you did, one particular event, one particular incident, one particular tzedakah that you gave was more special than the rest of them. The different levels. It could be that one ma'aseh gives you tremendous credit that will save your life. I want to share with you an incredible, incredible story that happened with my uncle, Allah Shalom. For those of you who remember in the past, we were talking about the 70s right now, a bypass surgery, do you know what a bypass surgery is? Mm -hmm. yeah. it used to be complicated and lasted quite a few hours and was not always successful. You know, this is in the early days, not like today. They do a chick chak they do it very quickly, they do it with stents, they do all kinds of things today. In those days, it was not an easy operation. My uncle, unfortunately, had to go through a bypass operation. So it took, I think, eight hours for the whole operation. Why did it take so long? Because once they were done, they had to reconnect the heart. What they used to do is they disconnected the heart and had a machine work it, you know, with the blood. And then, once they're done, they reconnect it to the, to the new pipes. The problem is, when they reconnected, the heart wasn't starting. So I remember my father made a phone call to a tremendous big rabbi, big, big tzaddik that was here in Los Angeles for a number of years. His name was the Rimnitz Rebbe. This big tzaddik was so great that one time there was no levana outside, Kiddush levana. He went outside and took out a handkerchief and did this, and all of a sudden the clouds went away. Mm -hmm. I'm not exaggerating wow. whatsoever. He was a tzaddik that he used to go to Laurel Canyon in the middle of the night. He used to ask for people to drive, stop the car here, and he would say Kaddish in the middle of the night for something there. We're talking about something that you think lived hundreds of years ago. There were tzaddikim like that. And Baruch Hashem, we had the zakhut to have in this city somebody like that. Somebody that could just tell, tell you everything. He was a very holy man. Very, very holy. And uh, so he was in Palm Springs resting a little bit. So my father got a hold of his gabayim. And this is what he said. Let's call him, let's make a minyan, he said to his people. And they prayed, they said Tehillim. Then the message came out, told, you know, was told my father, it will be a difficult operation, but in the end he'll come out of it. Exactly as he said, that's what happened. It, will be, it was difficult, and then Baruch Hashem, he came out of it. The heart started working after eight hours. Oh. All right. That was, a, that was an interesting story in itself, but that's not the more the more important part that I want to share with you. When he finally, the Baruch Hashem, recovered, he told us what he saw, Bashamayim, because when the heart stopped working for a number of minutes or whatever, his Neshama went upstairs. He was in Bet in Shemala, he says. I was in the upper court, in the heavenly court. And he says, and I heard communication, not that I saw, but he was, he said, I can tell it was angels. One camp of angels was saying on his right, let him go already. Now, let me tell you about my uncle. My uncle was a very righteous person. He was a Talmud Chacham, devoted husband, great father. I mean, he was a very special person in many, many ways. I mean, he, this is not an ordinary person. He was a principal for many years. He was he devoted his majority of his life for education of Jewish children, whether it was in South America or in Mexico or here, wherever he went. He was a wholesome, complete person in, many, in, in his character, in, in mitzvot, in every way. So here, what is, he, what is he here? And he's in his late 40s. He was 47. He later had another operation when he was older, in his 50s. But here he's 47 years old. And he says he hears a camp of angels on one side saying, ah, let him go. In other words, let him die. In other words, Baruch Hashem, he accomplished. You know, he doesn't have to come back to this world. You know, people think that there is, you know, if you leave behind kids, that's a reason to come back. There are many, many stories of people who have near-death experiences. You know what a near-death experience? They went and they came back. Where well, Bashamayim, they told them that's not a reason to go back. You have to give us a real reason why you want to go back. That 
because of my children, because of the, of the family. That's not an acceptable reason. It's just everybody has children. So what? Anyway, so that's why he hears this camp saying, let him go. In other words, Baruch Hashem. He did what he had to do. You know, what can we do? You know, people get sick, you know, operations, and uh, it's, operation is dangerous. And uh, you want to be careful, obviously, that you don't put yourself in danger. But what can you do? You know, he was, he didn't plan on it. So he hears him saying, let him go. All of a sudden, he hears voices coming from the other side. No, 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 no. Let him live. Why? There's one mitzvah that he did a long time ago when he was a young man in the yeshiva. He's not married yet. And because of that mitzvah, he deserves to live. In other words, that mitzvah should, should give him additional years of life. What was that mitzvah? There was a family that had recently arrived from South America. They didn't know the language. The father did not have a job. They did not have a place to live. And he went out of his way, even though he didn't know who they are. But they are strangers. And he found the man an apartment, I believe, that he could rent. And he found him a job, right? He helped him out, and basically, he put him on his feet, as they say. He set him up, this whole family. And here is my uncle, many years after the fact, right? I would say that it's at least 25 years after the fact, approximately 25 years after the fact, after the story, hearing this in Shemaim. And as soon as the, this Malachim said, let him live, all of a sudden his eyes opened up, the heart started working, everything came back to normal. He was obviously weak for, for a little while, but this is what he remembered. I, when I shared this story with some of my relatives, they told oh, we totally forgot about that. How could you forget something like that? Mm -hmm. That's something so incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a dream. It's not a dream. These kinds of dreams don't happen. This was a fact. Where people... Now he, not only him, others have had a similar situation where Bashamayim, they judged him for, and they evaluated his life. And they decided, you know what? For this merit alone, you deserve to live. So that was this one merit, this one incident, this one act of tzedakah that has saved his life or that added additional years to his life. I say added because there's a machloket in the Gemara if when they extend your life. Are they extending your life for what you were supposed to live anyway? Or that they actually add numbers of years to your life that you were not supposed to live. Right? So there's the two opinions. For the most part, for the most part, it is possible that they will extend a person's life even though he wasn't supposed to live that much. So in other words, tzedakah, tatzil mimavid, we know. It can save you from death. It can protect you. It can also add years to your life. And there are many, many such stories in the Gemara where a person's life was lengthened, extended because of tzedakah. And especially if the tzedakah is a special form of tzedakah, where you put somebody on his feet. What does it mean to put somebody, la midotol araglaim, as we say in Hebrew? Rabbis tell us that if you give charity to, to a poor man, that's a beautiful, big mitzvah. If you're encouraging him, when you give him words of encouragement, that's even better. But you know which is the highest level of tzedakah? That you don't give him money. You go and find him a job. Find him a job where he can preserve his dignity and make and earn a living and continue to work so he doesn't have to beg anymore. That's a bigger mitzvah. If you can do that for someone, that is the biggest and highest form of tzedakah, much more than giving him $10,000. No. Find him a job. To put him on his feet. Let him be able to restore his dignity, uh, to be able to maintain a normal life, to be able to provide for someone in a respectful way, that is a higher form of charity than just giving money. Me. Yes? It's really like this, that the ordinary uh, make the life lengthier. <coughs> there are other mitzvot. Coming, coming to the shul. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, a person who's regular, coming to shul, min shahrit, min ha'arit, on a regular basis, that schut also can lengthen his life. Yeah. There was once a woman, this is a true story, that was old and in pain. She was suffering. She was oh. sick. And she just couldn't die. <laughs> you know, sometimes people just want to get it over with. But she just didn't die. So they came to ask the big rabbi what to do with her. You know, she's, you know, she's miskena, as we say. You know. So what can we do? So he asked the sheep, 
go to shul every day? She says, yeah, every day she's there. Tell her to stop going. <laughs> <laughs> she stopped going and then she passed away. <laughs> anyway, obviously, we don't understand these things. Uh, but we do know that certain things you're right on. Certain things do preserve or give zechuyot to a person and protects him in this time of need and lengthens his life. Yeah, I'm sure. The various mitzvot. One additional idea about ten chelak leshiva v'gam lishmona, give to seven, give to eight, is what the Rambam says, that when it comes to charity, the number of times you give is more important than the amount you give. Let's say you have a thousand dollars to give. Should you give it to one person, two people, or give it to a thousand people? A thousand people. You give a thousand people a dollar to each one, you give a thousand mitzvot. Now, even though that's what the Rambam says, I'm not suggesting that you should do that. Because you may not want to give just a dollar to a person who really needs fifty dollars. See what I mean? But the idea is correct. The idea is is what he's talking about here. That you want to spread it out. Why spread it out? Not only because ribuya maasim, ribuya mitzvot is more reward, not only because of that, the more a person gives to people, the easier it, beca- it is for him to give. Because he's gotten used to the act of giving. Mm-hmm. Right? So give to seven, give to eight, give more and more. You're not going to become poor. Obviously, you don't want to give all your money away. You have to be calculated. But give. Don't, don't be tired of giving. All right, next pasuk. If you have a lot of people who are in the world, you can see that the people who are in the world are in the world. Also, a difficult pasuk to understand. Some of these pasukim are really, really difficult. I mean, what is he trying to say? Not the words. I'll, first, I'll translate, and then you'll see what I mean. If you have a lot of people who are in the world, fill up with rain. They dump the rain on the ground. And if a tree falls down in the south or in the north, wherever the tree falls, that's where it will stay. That's where it will be. What is he talking about here? So one idea is that he's talking about the rich because it's a continuation from what he said about before. Those who have the money, those who have the ability to help others. He says, think about it. Whenever the clouds fill up with rain, what's going to happen to all that rain? It's going to be dumped somewhere. And it hopefully will be dumped in a place where it, the rain is needed. If there's a tree in the south, a tree in the north, wherever the trees are, wherever the rain is needed, there it will come. So the Pasuk is talking about how Hashem maneuvers, or how He takes care of rain wherever it is needed. And the process of how water is accumulated into the clouds, I think most of you know, right? Through condensation, and then it's dumped through the wind further down wherever it is needed. Shem sa- so the Shlomo Melech says, rich people have been given money. Why? Because they are like the clouds who are holding this money to be able to dump it, not necessarily dump money, but to be able to give it to those who need it, to wherever it is needed. Not, it's not any different, he says. In the same way that the clouds fill up with water to give rain where it's needed, Hashem has given the rich, not because they deserve it necessarily. They are entrusted with this money. For some reason, they, that's their mission. And they will use that money, hopefully, for a good cause. They will give it to wherever it's needed. And, hopefully, obviously, if a person doesn't do tzedakah, the rich man does tzedakah, then in the same way that the clouds replenish themselves with new rain and more water, the rich man's money will be replenished too. (laughs) Right? It's a cycle. It will come back if you use the money right. And the fact that he talks about the trees, wherever they are, wherever they happen to be planted, because as you know, seeds travel. And the tree falls here, and the tree falls there, whether it was by a bird or by the wind, the trees go all over the place. Wherever there's a trees, wherever there's a need, Hashem takes care of all His briot, of all His creation. So that is, is, is a, an important idea too, because one of the keys, the rabbi tells Hashem has several keys. The key of Geshem is in His hand. I mean, Hashem, of course, controls everything, but keys are very unique, that Hashem decides when to open and when to close. And there, are, when a women have kids, that's one key. Geshem and Parnasa is another key. Hashem decides when to open, when to give, when there will be rain, when there will not be rain. 
And there may be reasons on why he closes it and why he opens it up later. So in the same way that these keys are in the hands of Hashem, and Hashem takes care of all his biryot, trust in him. Trust in him and don't be too concerned about, oh, I, I gave so much. I'm already, I've already done the mitzvah. No. Trust in Hashem that Hashem will continue to give you, Hashem will continue to provide for you in the same way that you are providing for others. Now this concept of fear that some people have, fear of giving, or fear of getting married, or fear of having children, fear of parnasah, is basically the topic that he's going to talk about now. So he starts off with this mashal of Geshem, and how Hashem takes care of everything, wherever there's a tree, wherever there's a need, and therefore you trust in Him. So listen to what he said, very, very interesting. Shomer ruach lo izra, v'ro'e be'avim lo iktsor. Another one of those difficult pesukim. One who watches the wind may not plant, may not seed, and one who looks at the clouds may not harvest his field. Why? Some people watch out for the wind. If it's a windy day, they're not going to put seeds. Try putting seeds of grass on your gra uh, seeds of grass on your lawn, and you will see pigeons and birds coming to eat it up. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Anyway. There are people who are afraid to plant at certain times because it's not the opportune, the best time to do it. It could be either the wind will blow it away, that's one interpretation, or the other interpretation is that they wait for the wind to scatter it evenly. Whichever way you look at it, they wait for the wind. And because they're not, they don't have the right wind, they don't want to plant. And they look at the clouds, oh, if it's going to be too rainy, that's not a time to harvest the field. In other words, they're watching the weather. What is he saying here? So one interpretation could be that this is connected to the past Pesukim. There are those who are afraid that by giving money, tzedakah, they're going to become poor. Right? Or they say, you know what, I'm afraid to give charity because there are some crooks out there who don't really need the money. All these fears are unfounded, he's saying. That's not a reason, that's not an excuse not to give. You have a mitzvah, you don't have to fear. It's true there are crooks out there. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you get 100 people a year to your door. And two or three don't really need it. I'm not going to call them crooks, Hazel Shalom. They don't really need the money, or their story is exaggerated. And maybe one of the letters is not real. Okay. And you feel bad, you know, you've given to somebody that doesn't really need it. You, you would have preferred that this money should go to good cause. All right. But the other 97 people are, are okay, right? Now, so what's this person going to say? I don't want to give because I'm afraid of the crooks. I'm afraid of giving those who don't deserve it. Right? The reality is, and that's what I tell people, what I do is, I'd rather be guilty of giving someone that did not need the money than to be guilty of not giving to somebody who actually needed the money. If you're going to make a mistake, it's better to make a mistake with someone who didn't need it than to make the mistake that this one really, really needed the money and you didn't want to give him. Which mistake is, <laughs> is worse? You don't want a not give when somebody really needs. He's starving, right? You could save his life. For those of you who remember the, the, the late 80s and early 90s, people lost their homes. Remember those days? All they needed was maybe one payment to save their home from a mortgage. One payment they needed. Those, it's not like today that the bank said you have three years to pay, you know, they don't want to take care of your house. In those days they took it over. And people sometimes would have been able to save their homes with one more payment or so. You have to be very, very careful. Very, very careful. Not to be guilty of Hazrat not having helped somebody that really needed it. What can we do? It's true, there are crooks, there are people who are not truthful. So what? Everybody else should suffer because of them? Yes? What about, Rama, if you give it to somebody to give the charity for you. Right. Somebody, so you appoint someone, you give them the charity, and you trust them. Trust them to That's fine too. Remember, you, we all need a merit. We all need a schut that our money should go to a good cause. Exactly. So. Not everybody's merit. Yumiyahu Navi was so upset at the Jews of his generation that he asked the Shem in a special prayer send them people that don't need money. That, so that their tzedakah 
should go to the wrong people, so they should not have a zechut for giving tzedakah. Because if your money goes to the wrong people, you don't get the same. You don't get the same kind of zechut. You didn't help people. <laughs> your money was in the garbage. So that's not good when a person's money ends up going to the wrong cause. So obviously we have to have zechuyot. So Hashem okay. should. Yeah, but you, if you trust somebody that you know is God fearing, because when it comes to money, remember it has to be somebody who's God fearing. That you 100% that you trust, and hopefully Hashem should help that this is in fact, indeed, a good cause that He's giving the money to. Because you feel that the other person is maybe better suited, or yeah, whoever, you, yeah, that's fine. Yes, what? yes. Rabbi, if yeah. We we have uh, hashata that somebody does not need the money. Give him a little bit. It doesn't. It doesn't make any. Doesn't, doesn't hurt, exactly. Yeah. That's right. So we do it even if we have to yeah. suspect to some people still giving them. Yeah, that's a simple understanding over here too. You, a person doesn't have to be too concerned from you know, any worries. Uh, hopefully, Hashem will help him. You, know, you can't worry too much. And the reason why you can't worry too much is because what is he trying, what's, what's the message of this Pasuk? The message here is Shomer Ruach Lo Yizra. If a person is overly uh, suspicious and overly careful, he will never end up planting, never end up seeding, never end up harvesting because of his fears. If that's the attitude a person has, he will never marry. He's afraid of getting married. She's afraid of getting married. Oh, you know, I heard all kinds of horror stories. And they don't think because of the horror stories, they don't get married. Who says it's going to happen to you? You have to trust in Hashem. Rabbi tell us, Don't be from those who are so small in their faith, Nemuna. Be trusting a little bit in Hashem. When it comes to real estate, they tell you the same thing. If you want to make a dollar, you've got to take a risk. In the investment, it's all about risk, depending on how big the risk. Of course, you don't have to take a big risk. But you always have to take some risk. If you don't risk a little bit, you're not going to get it. You're not going to make anything. So you can't just stay back and because of certain fears, not do anything. And the same is true with emunah and mitzvot. A person cannot have the attitude that I need to wait for the opportune time to do this. I know some Israelis who have told me, you know, after they finish with the army, they're going to come to America. They're going to make a lot of money, right? And once they've made a lot of money, they're going to buy a house. And after they buy a house, they're going to get married. And after that, they're going to start keeping Shabbat. You see how the Cheshbon is? <laughs> First of all, as soon as they come here, they don't make money. They usually work as, as movers, right? All kinds of jobs, menial jobs. They don't make it so fast, right? And as far as getting married, you know, by the time they decide to get married, they're bald and fat. You know, who's <laughs> going to marry them, right? The time is going by, keeping Shabbat, keeping mitzvot, that, that, that doesn't come. You can't push things off. You can't wait for opportune time. Oh, when this happens, when I do that, when do that? At this stage of my life, that's when I'll do it. You may never get to there. Chazu Shalom. Don't push it off. If it's something right, if it's something good, you do it right away. You don't push it off. Oh, no, but I don't have enough money to get married. I sat down with, with a Persian gentleman, a young guy, who's in his mid-20s. So when are you getting married? I need to make a lot of money so I can make a big wedding. You heard? He needs to make a lot of money first because he wants to have a big wedding. Probably he wants to have an Armenian singer too, and he wants to know who, who, who all kinds of stuyot, nonsense, vanities. That's his reason why he's pushing off. He told me that that's the reason I don't want to get married. I want to first make a lot of money, so I can make a big wedding. Have your wedding in your backyard. Who needs it? You know, I tell you, you know, write in the invitation that there's no food, and that's it. You only not everybody's going to come. That's it. That's it. Forget it. You know, that's it. You know, only your very true close friends will come. So you, you, you want to spend $50,000 or more to feed people who wouldn't come if there's no food? What kind of friends are these? So it's, just, it's just about show. That's all it is, is about show. And people tell me, oh, I'm part of this community. There's so much pressure. I just got to do it. They're going to look down at me. Because they're going to look down at you, you're going to go into debt, push it off. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. That's what Kohelet is telling us over here. Don't pay attention to all these concerns. Just do the right thing. The right thing is to get married and not to worry. But I don't have any money. money. That's not a reason not to get married. It's true that ideally you should ha have a home. It's true that ideally you should have a job before you get married. Of course, the Rambam said so. But that was in his time. 
Today, if you want to own your own home before you get married, you have to wait till you're 55. Maybe by then, you'll have a down payment in a house. <laughs> if it's not, who knows if you can make it by then. Today, it's impossible, depending on, unless you want to move to the Sahara Desert or to a place where things are cheaper. You can't push it off. If, if, a, if a young man is of marriageable age and he finds, of course, something that is somebody that is good for him, he can't push it off for reasons of not enough money. What will be? First of all, when the two of you come together, the mazal of the husband and wife is stronger than just the mazal of, the, of each individual. And Hashem says his beracha too. Hashem takes care. He says, he, I'll take care of you. We have to trust him. So, that, so this is a very important point about not having to worry about things, how they will unfold, or whether they will happen. If I have kids, will I be able to pay for tuition? Jewish education is expensive, they say. How will I pay for it? That's not a reason to, to, to be concerned. Yonatan ben Uziel says on this pasuk, that Shomer Ruach lo ve ve'ro'eh ba'avim lo yitzod, it's talking about mazalot, about looking at the stars, about trying to figure out the best time to do things. It's against the Torah, it's not right to do that. It's totally prohibited. Uh, first of all, all these things with the mazalot, when it comes to figuring out things with the stars, it's like the wind and like the clouds. They go away, things change. It's not exactly the way we predicted it. Don't rely on this on mazalot to try to find the opportune time. First of all, it's against it, what the Torah says. The Torah says not to do that. And number two, it's all, it's all Hocus pocus like because ultimately Hashem is the one that takes care of us. Amisa believes in Ashgachat Eliona, Ashgachat Hashem. He provides for us. So that's not a reason to postpone or to, you know, to figure out when to do it, when not to do it. No, just Tamim Tiyem Hashem Elokecha. Have complete faith in Hashem. One more Pasuk. Ka'asher en cha yodea ma derech haruach ba'atz. Just like you don't know in which direction the wind is blowing, if you're indoors and you don't have any special instruments, you don't know in which direction the wind is blowing. Neither do you know what's going on in a woman's womb. Ka'atzami means like the enclosure of her stomach. You don't know if it's a girl or a boy unless you do an ultrasound, right? <laughs> you don't know. But. Some of the older ladies will tell you, uh oh, I see the way she's walking, I see she's round, it's a girl. That's the old, that's the <laughs> grandmother tales, yeah? You know, I see the way she's walking, I see the shape. We don't know what's going on in her stomach, right? It says, in the same way, you don't know which direction the wind is blowing, and you don't know what's going on in the woman's stomach, a pregnant woman. You can never figure out the ways of Hashem. He does everything. You can't figure out. Therefore, you cannot worry. You cannot make plans for everything. It's impossible. Chizkiyahu was punished. Chizkiyahu Melech was a righteous king. He didn't want to get married. Why? Because he didn't want to have children. Why not? Not because of Jewish education. Not because of tuition. Right. He yeah. saw with Ruach HaKodesh that Menashe is going to come out of him. He's going to have a child of Rasha. The problem of his Ruach HaKodesh, even though it's Ruach HaKodesh, it's divine inspiration, you cannot tell if the person will do Teshuvah or not. Named. Only Hashem knows. So, so, so Yeshayahu Anavid came and gave him Musar. What do you start messing around with the mysteries of Hashem? Mysteries, you know, with Hashem's plans. You, you have a mitzvah, pru to procreate, to get married, to have kids. Don't worry about everything else. You can't start thinking about these things. You can't start worrying, well, how am I going to handle this? I'm, no, if it's something that you're supposed to do, you do it. You, we don't know, just like we don't know the way the wind is blowing, we don't know what's going on in a, mother, in, a, in a woman's womb. We don't know the workings of Hashem. We have no way of understanding the ways of Hashem. You know, what's going to be with money, what's going to be with this, plans that people worry about. And because of that, the Torah tells us, Tamim Tiyem Hashem Elokecha. What's Tamim Tiyem Hashem Elokecha? It's a very, very powerful statement, very, very powerful mitzvah or concept. To trust in Hashem completely. In other words, our emunah should not just be partial, it should be tamim, complete, sincere. with the eyes closed, sincere. Not in genuine, when it was not half ways. When we say in the Shema Yisrael, with all your heart, it says with both of your hearts. It says two hearts. 
when it's good times and when it's bad times. Because there are no real bad times. But when we, we perceive them as a bad, always love Hashem. Accept what, has, what Hashem has given you. Because Hashem knows what's best for us. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pray to Him. We can always pray <coughs> and ask Him to improve things. But to always accept what, we, what, we, what we have. Yeah. Uh, how could you say it's perceived as bad, for example, when you have old ladies that don't have enough money to buy food or they're living in dire, dire poverty and yeah. pain? Yeah. How a, is that a lot of people are, are, are living uh, difficult, um, through difficult times. So the, I think it was the Chafetz Chaim or some other great rabbi who once overheard someone saying, uh, life is, is hard or is bad. He says, don't say that. You can say life is bitter, but it's not bad. Everything is good. Everything that comes on Mishamayim is good. It's beneficial for some, for, for some reason, somehow. We don't know it. Like he says here, we, don't, we can't figure out the workings of Hashem. Like we don't know what's going on in a, mother, in a woman's womb. But it's good. Everything is for a purpose. It's not random. It's not definitely not uh, cruel. It's good. Hashem is tov lakol rachamav akom masav. He has pity on everything. It's His creation. He cares about us. We have no idea how much He loves us. Right? But we perceive things because our perception is wrong. So you can say it's better. But what they're going through, these women, or, or people who are going through a hard time, it's all in Hashemayim. With the exception of people who are lazy. Last time we, we discussed uh, Kohelet, we learned Kohelet, we mentioned a little bit about laziness. Laziness is discussed at length in, in Mishle as well. People who are lazy, of course, they hurt themselves. They should go out to work. They should make money. Why not? If a person is lazy, it's his fault. If a person is an alcoholic or drug addict, it's his fault. There are things that are brought about, misery, that it's people's fault. Yeah, but we're not talking about that. Things that are out of our control, not in our hands, are mazal. That's only in Shemayim. So this is a very important concept of trusting in Him and having complete faith. And only in, only in this way, if a person really has complete faith, will he not be worried. He will not be worried about competition, right, in business. He will not be worried about, oh, I just, he just lost the opportunity to buy something. Somebody snatched it before he can get to it. I should have bought that house. Hey, wait a minute, it wasn't meant for you. See, people don't think like that. It, the emunah is not completely tamim. They actually thought that they can get it. He went for an interview, he dressed up, he put on his most expensive tie, right? A nice suit. He didn't get the job. Oh, why not? He's bitter, he's disappointed. It's Nashamayim. Or somebody did something to him. He's going to get back at him. I'm going to tell you revenge. Chaz v'shalom. Just because he was bad, you have to be bad now to him. You see? Revenge is, is wrong. It's Hashemayim. Leave it to him. Hashem straightens everything out. That, that's if, if Bed Din over here in the courts down here cannot straighten it. If they straighten it here, they straighten it. If they cannot straighten it, don't worry. But that judge must, doesn't know. He's bribed. Don't worry about it. If he makes a mistake, they take care of him upstairs. If people really knew just a little bit of this, there would be no disappointments, no sadness. Everybody would be happy. It doesn't mean that you could be happy every minute of your life. We have our ups and downs. I'm not saying that it's impossible uh, not to be unhappy. Of course it's possible. It's very easy to be unhappy. Things go wrong, not as planned. But as long as we catch ourselves on time and realize, well, wait a minute, what should I be upset for? After all, it's been then it's okay. At first, you know, life is hard. Sometimes there's bills to pay. There are, there's all kinds of things that happen, that, you know, bureaucracy that we were upset at, all kinds of things. Health issues, uh, people get sick, hospital, kidney stones, <laughs> everything is possible. But you have to, you, the attitude has to be good. And that's, of course, what restores a person's tranquility, is when he realizes that in the end, it's all for our benefit. So if we don't learn, Musar, we don't learn Kohelet or Mishle. It's very, it's much more difficult. Then a person says, you know, why? He starts complaining. Where is God? You know, hey, why don't you go learn the Torah? You'll, you'll find him. <laughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> what would cause when somebody always had a good uh, uh, parnasa, like until the older 
ages and yes. suddenly they lose everything and they become um, that's a good question. What, you know, what causes a person to lose his parnasah after many years of having parnasah? You know, I wish I had Hashem's email. <laughs> you know, and I would send him an email and hopefully he'll answer my question. But, you know, we don't have an email. And we don't have a phone or a fax. No, 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 no. But there are many possibilities. There are many possibilities. You mentioned Hashem yeah. chose somebody and gives money for a purpose. To right. Give or give or sure, sure, sure. Everybody has a, a mission. How come suddenly uh, somebody... There's so many possibilities. Real quickly. person has money, a lot of money, for all these years, and all of a sudden he loses it. It could be possibility number one, that his mazal was only for 35 years to have money, not mazal for the whole life. It could be Hashem entrusted him the money to use it but he did not use it for the right thing, so he took it away from him, number two. Number three, kaparata vonot, which is very often. In other words, he became a Baal Teshuvah in his later years, he became a better person. Hashem says, oh, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Haba, welcome. Now that you're a good person, I want to clean you up here, not upstairs. So I'm going to take away money from you, because money is easier to take than physical body illnesses. A person would rather pay money than to be in the hospital, right? So Hashem says, let me first take your money. I'm going to take so much money, and uh, if it's at the end of the life, it's, it could very possibly be that, a kaparata vonot. It, that's another possibility. And a fourth possibility is that he d committed a tremendous sin, right? And it could, that sin could have been 25 years ago, and now, only, and now Hashem is taking care of it. Why now? Because during those 25 years, he had children to raise and to send to school. Hashem did not want to touch his finances then. They don't deserve, the kids don't deserve to, to suffer. Only him. Hashem says, let him get out of the home. I'll get him when he's, when he's in the 60s or 70s. That's the fourth possibility. There's a, then there's a fifth possibility that it has to do with a previous reincarnation altogether. Previous reincarnation. That he robbed somebody. He robbed somebody in the previous reincarnation and he, the money was never given back to that person. Shem says, no. They both come back. Shem, this time you're going to lose the money and he's going to make it. To, so to restore that money to where it belongs to for a previous recognition, that is also a possible addition. So you see, what does this come down to? To what he says over here. We don't know. In Chayudea, Maderech Haruach Batsamim Babetin HaMelea. Kacha. Lo teda et maaseh alokim. The same way that you don't know the wind, where it's blowing, you don't know things that are going on in a mother's womb. We have no idea of Hashem's working. So the best thing is to be accepting that Hashem does everything for the right thing, and that, of course, requires tamim tiyem Hashem lokecha, that our emunah should be strong and complete, and never doubtful. However, despite all that, it's very, very helpful to learn. Because when a person learns, he gets a little bit of an idea of what's going on, what are the possibilities. I just shared with you several possibilities. The average individual, the average Jew even, does not think that way. He doesn't, he starts complaining, he's upset. A chunk of money was just erased from his bank account. You think Hashem is not aware of that? You think Hashem does not provide for him? He's going to be now left without a penny? Hashem will take care of him. People will help him. He will not, he will not die of hunger. Right? Everything will be taken care of. But if you don't learn, you don't realize that. that everything is for the good. Everything has a reason. And that comes down to the big, the big issue that the Jews had during the time the Greeks were in control of Israel. Hanukkah, the story of Hanukkah that we spoke about last week. Am Yisrael believed continuously that Hashem is involved in events in this world. And the Greeks said, no. The Greeks said, yeah, I can accept that God created the world, but that He's involved here? He's so far away from us, so far removed. This is a big, one of the big differences between the Jewish people and the rest of the world. We, don't, we do not only believe God created the world, He's involved and He knows and He's aware of everything. And He does everything for a reason. Everything is planned, everything is designed. Except for the areas that we have free will. We do have a small area of free will that we are responsible for. Other, other than that, it's up to him. It's however he wants to do things. And that, of course, if we understand that, how much control Hashem has and how nothing escapes him, how everything is recorded, we will not have fears. We will trust him and we will do the right thing. Thank you.